Please join me in welcoming Katie Yamasaki. Hi, everybody. I'm amazed at the turnout, by the way. This is, I thought on 4th of July, nobody's going to come. This is stunning. This would be like the same amount if I were to do this in New York City right now. Um, so thanks so much for coming. I'm really happy to share my work. And I'm so grateful to Scott and Nancy for inviting me because I know that I do quite a bit of illustration and steadily more and more with children's books, but I also work as a muralist, so I'm, I really appreciate their open mind when it comes to kind of narrative art, and I'm going to share with you a lot of kind of my different projects. So when I, I'm going to give you a bit of background. When I was um, a kid, I was a kid who really liked to draw, but not a kid who drew amazingly. You know, yeah, I, I was an art teacher for about 14 years, and I had students who would fill their sketchbooks with stunning drawings, and that was never me. Um, and I, I came from a family of artists, so my grandfather was an architect, my Japanese grandfather was an architect, my grandmother was a pianist, um, I had an uncle who was a photographer, and I had a lot of artists on one side of the family. My um, mother's side of the family were, um, they were Catholic workers, for those of you who are familiar with the Catholic worker movement, they were... Uh, kind of the super left wing of the Catholic Church I'd worked with Dorothy Day. So I kind of came from a gigantic family that was very uh, racially and ethnically and religiously diverse. Um, and I grew up kind of in a hippie enclave in a uh, factory town north of Detroit. We were a group of kids who were not allowed to watch much TV. This is what happened. That's me on the left. Or the right. The right. Um, so that was, that's a little bit about my background, but the, the context, the community that we existed in was in a town that was dominated by a jam factory. And so growing up Japanese American in the 1980s, what that meant was that people who came to my high school would often have stickers like this on their on their car. Uh, this man, Vincent Chin, some of you may be aware of him, he was murdered by factory workers um, because he's Chinese American, but they thought he was Japanese American. So that was the kind of social and political climate that we grew up around. So I kind of grew up knowing that both I had really kind of creative and successful Japanese relatives and also people who did meaningful work in World War II, like my great uncle, who was a, um, he was a U.S. prisoner of war in uh, Germany during World War, II, World War II, where he served as a medic, uh, while his family, including my great aunt and my great grandparents, were all in the internment camps. So I kind of grew up with this um, interesting combination of like a assault against Japanese American culture in the in the present situation that I lived in but um, kind of also surrounded by an extremely loving community of people that my parents were part of this kind of back to the land movement so that was the kind of mentality that we were raised in um, so I, I didn't grow up doing much art though I was very intimidated by my grandfather's success and he was the chief architect of the World Trade Center and among other things so I was kind of like that's his lane, and that's my grandmother's lane. She was a um, concert pianist. I'll go into social work. I was interested in social justice. So I, I went to Earlham College, which is in Richmond, Indiana. It's a Quaker school. And when I got there, I um, started taking social work classes, and I hated them. <laughs> so I started taking drawing classes, and I loved them, but I was terrible. So I was, I was 19, going on 20, and I was trying to learn how to draw. And there were a lot of people were um, from really good school, good high schools. I didn't go to a good high school. I went to a high school that fed people directly into the GM factory. It was an auto tech program. I went to a high school that fed people into like a like a hairstyling and then auto tech. And then if you were smart, you went to the General Motors Institute. So I didn't. None of those lanes kind of were the right one for me. So I didn't study art in high school. But when I got to college, I, I realized that I loved how it felt to draw, and I loved how it felt to kind of like look differently at things that I had always looked at because all of a sudden I was trying to render them onto paper. But I would put my drawings up to next to my classmates' drawings, and I would be like, whoa. I, I remember I did this self-portrait, and I remember being so proud of it. I was like, well, this is something I didn't know how to do before. You know, and I wasn't like 11. You know, I, was, I was about almost 20. And then I put it up next to my classmates' drawings who went to these arts magnet high schools and things like that. And I remember feeling like, well, um, that is, there is like no way to compare these things, so I'm just not going to. You know, I felt like I liked the feeling of it enough to not really care where I measure up and in the class. So that made me at least kind of feel like I could go on without complete um, humiliation. And um, what was what was my biggest strike of luck, I think, was that Ed Young, who some of you may be familiar with, he's a children's book um, illustrator, who I think now he's in his mid-80s, but he and my aunt, they went to Tai Chi school together in New York City in the 60s. So when I was a sophomore, went into my junior year of college, 
he needed somebody to come and archive all of his children's book work for, um, like the at that point, the 80 children's books that he had written and those written and or written and illustrated. So I went and lived with him and his family. This is some of his work for one summer, and I got to go through all of his work. And he gave me the the incredible gift of looking through his sketchbooks because my sketchbooks looked like worse than this. This is the <laughs> stuff I was doing in class. So my sketchbooks looked worse than this. So he he let me look through his sketchbooks, and I expected them to look like master drawings because he was a masterful artist. But they didn't, you know. And he said, "Oh, most of your drawings, if you're drawing things you don't know how to draw, and if you're learning, most of your drawings aren't going to be that good." And so that was like an incredible gift to me because I was 21 or 20, and I was feeling really self-conscious, and I was feeling like I need to choose a major, and um, how do I choose a major that will like be where I can have some kind of impact or where I can find meaning in my work and have hopefully other people find meaning in it. So. Um, my dad said, even though I was still at this very beginning phase, he said, if you do what you love, um, you're, you'll, you're, you will be most effective in the world. So um, I dropped the social work angle, and I started kind of, after working with Ed, I started kind of learning how to do collage. And I was kind of simultaneously learning how to do collage while I was learning how to draw. So a lot of these things, you know, and it was interesting because when I applied to art school for my master's, they kind of looked at it like, oh, you're a naive artist. And it's funny to feel like an educated person and then be called naive and naive <laughs> artist. But I was like, all right, I guess so. Uh, but I, uh, I went to, um, I, I graduated in 1999 and took a year to teach and um, teach Spanish. I, I learned Spanish. Uh, but I went to the School of Visual Arts for their Master's of Fine Arts and Illustration program. And that's where I started painting. So before that, I had never picked up a paintbrush, really, unless it was to paint an entire paper to then cut out and make it into a collage. So I started learning how to paint, and um, it's funny because I don't think that my paintings look that different now than they did back then. <laughs> but in graduate school, I had the second big strike of good luck, which was um, in my, my school, They for your second year, they give half of your, or part of your tuition to a mentor of your choosing. So you basically ask a teacher, or ask an artist in New York City if they will mentor you. So I, I asked Leo and Diane Dillon if they would teach me. And, Hopefully most of you know them because they are, and they were as amazing and beyond and generous as you could imagine. So every other week I would go to their house for a couple hours and sit down with them and they would kind of share with me technique and they helped me with my thesis. And so when I finished school I thought, okay, well now I'm going to break into the children's book world. And that was 2003. So I, I had an agent and I thought, well, this is going to be my world now, but I couldn't sell a book. So um, my friend's mom who was a librarian in South Orange, New Jersey, she said, why don't you come and paint a mural at my school? And I had just learned to paint the year before, so the idea of painting something gigantic was daunting, but I was like, well, I can probably do that better than the fifth grade students at that school, so I will go ahead and do it. You know, that's kind of my attitude. It was like, well, I can do it maybe better than the kids who are gonna look at it, so I will go ahead, and there's nothing there before, and they can always paint over it. So, um, so, I, so I did my first mural, and I, what I really liked, because my plan was never to really isolate myself in a studio and just kind of work in silence and work in like solitude. So I really loved the interaction with the students and with the administrators and with the custodians, and um, so that kind of became, that was my first project. And alongside of that, I had to figure out how I was going to make a living. And I, I um, was offered a teaching job two days a week at a public school in New York City called Ballet Tech. It's a public school for ballet dancers. So they audition 30,000 kids every year at third grade. And they choose 1,000 of them who have like the potential to be ballet dancers. So of those kids, they choose an additional, they choose 50 to be in this public school private ballet foundation partnership. They hired me as an art teacher. And what I loved about it so much was that the kids' um, kind of openness to expression and also what my own um, kind of relationship to finding meaning in my work. Because I think that there is a misconception in my, in my graduate program that like you're really doing it, you're really making it when you're working by yourself in your studio. And I found that collaborating with these kids to help them communicate what they wanted to communicate was um, hugely satisfying and kind of mind-opening. And um, we would kind of take our art all over the city and take our art into the world. And that kind of led me to do start doing some residencies in different parts of the world. This was in Chiapas, um, talking about like um, housing um, and displacement with different indigenous communities. And that was kind of when my work started traveling was um, in conjunction with the teaching. 
around that same time, I got my first big kind of outdoor mural project. I hadn't, um, I hadn't worked outside. I had done that little project in the library, and I had done one other small project in Detroit. And then this mural organization called Brown Twelve, they were looking for somebody who had worked on outdoor scaffolding, which I hadn't, who had like, led groups of students, which I also hadn't. But they wanted a woman, which I was, so I, you know, I, so I applied for the job, and they couldn't find anybody more experienced in this program, had a specific calendar that went with the City Summer Youth Employment Program. So I um, got the job, and so I got this group of uh, young women, and um, the idea of this program, it's called Voices Heard, and um, the idea was that the young women would choose the topic, and then I would build a curriculum around it. So they would choose the topic that they felt was most urgently um, kind of impacting them and their community. So, um, and I found that like this was the first time that I really uh, was exposed to participatory art in a way that I would then kind of carry through my career to this point. And what I was surprised by, and I think that the surprise factor is something that I have really delighted in, is that um, working with them, I, you know, I thought, oh, you know, they're teenage girls, they're gonna wanna talk about drugs, or they're gonna wanna talk about um, poverty or homelessness, or like really heavy things, because they're all from mostly poor communities. And what they wanted to talk about was like peer pressure, gossip, and like things that were like um, gossip, conflict at home, and kind of like very basic things to daily existence. So, so I think that the two main lessons that came from this very first big project, which is on Fourth Avenue in, um, in Park, Park Slope, Brooklyn, was that um, when I go in, if I go in truly open to a project with the community, I never actually know what they are going to want to make the work about. And that's really a great learning experience for me because I can go into all of my own assumptions about what they might want. And the other thing is that oftentimes the work doesn't turn out exactly how I hoped or planned. So for example, this one, 2003 was again like a year and a half after I first started painting. So I had this wall and um, technically there are so many things in this, mainly the main figure's face that I just was like, when the scaffolding came down, I was like, oh, that's not what it was supposed to look like. And I felt really disappointed. Also, you can't really see it from here, but in out of front one of is a metal rod protruding out that we didn't know was there until we got it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but the, the nice we had this dedication for the mural, you know, and I had been, I was feeling so self conscious about this stuff, and I was just like, oh, all of these things aren't working technically. And then um, the girls got up to speak about the project, and they were crying, and they were talking about how much it meant to them to just have this space to kind of communicate something about who they are now. Where, who they want to be and you know what the progress is like and um so afterwards I was kind of talking to my parents about it and um, my, my and I was kind of talking about my disappointment and my dad said well the thing is Katie this is actually not about you you know and so that was really liberating because it takes the pressure off you know I think sometimes if you have a, an exhibit in a gallery it really is about you and sometimes it's about your internal life or it's about something really personal this is about them so I think that like the the skill that I provide is um, kind of getting the project up on the wall and designing an image that you can have 12 people paint on at once who have very varying degrees of painting skill. So for example, that's not a brick building. Um, it's a it's just a stucco building, but I had, you know, four people who had never picked up a paintbrush before, so they painted bricks. You know, so so that and they got really good at it. But um, <laughs> but I think that like there are a lot of you know lessons in this and, and it also kind of provided the opportunity like through teaching to also learn about how to really interview people. This is a homeless shelter for women in Bedford Stuyvesant, in Brooklyn, and um, kind of how to transform a space um, kind of according to the people who occupy it. Because at the end of the day, like this is this was for a project that was about immigrant mothers who send their kids to this school in, um, in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, and it kind of about their journey. And it, these girls and my team, they were mostly uh, second, first or second generation themselves. And a lot of the questions, they were the ones who did the interviewing of their own and for a lot of them, they were asking them questions that they had never asked them before. So it kind of provides a space for inquiry that I feel like doesn't necessarily exist in our day-to-day -day life unless we're really intentional about it. So, so that um, I really like. This was an interesting project. Um, same group of girls kind of aging out as, as we go, but um, we, we kind of first get a wall. This is at the BQE with Brooklyn Queens Expressway and 3rd Avenue. Um, it's tons of traffic, so you've got fast moving traffic above where this um, where the where the kind of triangle is, and then slow moving six lane uh, avenue traffic here, and then there's a uh, um, residential street here. So you're kind of addressing the people who are going to drive by quickly and see the mural in a flash. You're addressing the people who are waiting at the bus stop there and have a lot of time. 
Um, so you kind of design according to that. And this was during the war in Iraq, and the girls in my group were very tired of the military recruitment that they were experiencing on a constant basis. So because they live in poor communities, there are military recruiters in their subway stations, at their schools, um, calling them on the phone uh, at home. So they, and what they felt was that they did not know how they were going to pay for college, but they also didn't feel like they were war fodder. You know, and some of them felt like maybe they would join the military, but they wanted to understand the complete picture. So I designed a curriculum where I kind of brought in female veterans um, from the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan and different um, different people who are kind of specialists in this area. So we designed this image that said, um, uh, arm yourself with the knowledge to think for yourself. We are not government issues. So this, what's cool about working on this is that nobody expects that it's a group of teenage girls coming out from behind that scaffolding. And, um, and including the girls themselves, they kind of have this experience of like, wow, I'm carrying five gallon buckets of paint up and down um, 2,400 square feet of scaffolding. You know, and the physical aspect of that, I think, impacts them on a significant, in a significant way. So this was, this mural was really interesting because at the mural dedication, which is what this is a picture of, um, there were in the shadows where the parachutes come down, so it says um, uh, at the top, uh, it says, keep the legal war out of our bodies, our neighborhoods, our, our communities, our schools, that type of thing. And then in the shadows of the parachutes, there are a lot of statistics that are written into the to the shadow from different sources, CNN, um, different like military sources, the um, Iraq and um, Afghanistan, all different veterans groups. But at the at the um, some of the statistics are really hard, you know, because the experience of veterans is incredibly hard in our country. And at the dedication, there was a a mother whose son had just come back from Iraq, and she was totally distressed by the mural. She felt like, you can't, you have to paint. She was part of this group that was protesting, and they were like, you have to paint this whole hat. You can't, it makes us look un-American. And she was like, I don't want my son reading all of this stuff. And so unbeknownst to her, the, a woman who was talking to her was a friend of mine who's a librarian, and she was, her son had come back from the war and committed suicide. And so she was saying, you know, you actually, it's important to read these things just to find out how you can best support your son. But I think that the, the randomness of a mural and the surprising conversations that can kind of come from it um, is what most kind of keeps me doing this work because those types of conversations don't necessarily happen in day to day life um, when people aren't crossing paths with each other. The, the suggestion was that so every time we paint a mural of this scale, you fire the whole neighborhood. This mural is coming. Please come and see our design before anything happens. Please come see the design. Please come give us feedback. You're welcome to part engage or participate. So we did that with this neighborhood. Nobody came. So we went ahead and painted the mural. When the scaffolding came down, there was this, it was a small but vocal group of about eight people who were like, you have to paint it out. It makes us look un-American. And then they would, then they said, you should just paint. We have met and we think you should paint people running in the park. And I was like, that is a large space for a jogging mural. But, so it stayed, and I think the interesting thing that came from that was just this conversation about how how readily we surrender to visual imagery all around us that is um, paid for, that is commercial. You know, when people are paying for it, people are, we're kind of like, well, it's there, they paid for it. So, and then, But when it's um, kind of an act of expression, especially by young women of color, uh, there's, a, there's a significant protest component. Um, most of the time, the young women who are in the program, we, I paint them directly into the mural. And depending on their skill level, they may help with that. But it's kind of a nice way to just remind the community of who actually lives there. And um, then for the girls, it's really wonderful for them to kind of have this thing to come back to. But also just to feel like, um, especially this was all before kind of Facebook and Instagram was so popular, but just that like young women can be the creators of the visual media about them large-scale visual media about young women typically is not created by young women or young women of color. So, um, so um, I'm going to kind of segue uh, and get to the books eventually, but this was, this was a project that I did kind of in collaboration with my students um, at Ballet Tech. I had, I had, which was the name of the school, I had um, gone to Cuba in 2007, 2006 for a mural conference. Um, Latin America, as most of you probably know, is huge on murals, including Cuba, and they host a Every other year, they host a big mural conference. So I had gone, and they invited me to come back and have an exhibit. And I was thinking, uh, what will the concept be for my exhibit? Because the everything was so loaded, and the politics were so intense. It was during George Bush, and it was so complicated between the U.S. and Cuba. It still is, but 
my, when I came back from Cuba, my students who had had a sub for the time I was gone, they were asking me all these questions. What was Cuba like? What were the kids in Cuba like? You know, and they had all these misconceptions, even though a lot of my students are, are from the Caribbean. You know, a lot of the New York City is a hugely Caribbean community. So, so I had my students kind of write postcards to the kids in Cuba and describe who they are and what their life is like in New York. Because similarly in Cuba, the kids had a huge misconception about what American kids were like. They thought they were all blonde hair and blue eyed. Um, or that they were living in an extreme violence. There were kind of these two uh, polarities. Um, so I thought I would show who my students are in the world that they describe using imagery from their own art because most of these kids I had, had in art class for like three to five years at that time. So uh, Brandon, I am a little wild sometimes and I'm also really good at math. Like I think he their postcards. This is Mari Mar. I live in Brooklyn, but I'm from Puerto Rico. Brooklyn is a very nice place, but bad things happen here. Uh, this is Robin. I love to draw on the train. Sometimes things are hard at home, and my mom is stressed when she looks at my drawings and makes her happy. Um, so I did, uh, the, okay, this is kind of like the process. So the kids would make a postcard. This is a kid named Cyrus's postcard. I would photograph them. This is in their dance class. Um, and then I, based on what they said, I would kind of make a painting of them. So Cyrus said, my name is Cyrus. I, um, I'm a vegetarian, even though there are no other vegetarians in my family. When I live in the Bronx and when I walk to the bus, I like to look at the birds. My favorite animals are monkeys, lions, and bears because although they are, or monkeys, tigers, and bears, because although they are vicious creatures, they all have a soft side when they get close to a human. <laughs> I, liked it. I liked it so much. So I, um, and then um, it was exhibited in the gallery in Cuba with the postcard and the translation and the text. And so then the kids in Cuba went around the gallery and they picked the New York City kids that they most closely identified with and then kind of had their opportunity to respond about what their life was like in Cuba. So I, I love doing this project because it kind of, um, again, it's like that element of surprise when you ask somebody to describe themselves, how they actually how they actually say they are. This is Devin and he talked about um, how he lives in Brooklyn and Brooklyn basketball rules and he talked about snowball fights and um, that was the year he was doing all rodent drawings in his sketchbook, so I included some of those. Um, so very <laughs> random. But again, surprising. This little girl, Anna, you see, she came to the gallery three or four times and made him like six or seven postcards. I think she was completely in love with him. <laughs> so I painted her postcard and she talked about Cuba and Santiago where we were. And then this was one I remember the first, when I first read it, I was horrified because she wrote, oh, I love New York because there's so much shopping, food stores, clothes stores, 99 cent stores. But New York is also bad because a lot of people get killed. Other than that, New York is great. Um, so, and I was kind of like, I was thinking, how will anybody from Cuba relate to that? Because, you know, the shopping in New York is wild, the consumerism is wild, and then the violence is also, Cuba is not a very violent country. Um, so this is Whitney. You know, it's also like powerful to kind of hear a kid that age have that type of um, insight, you know, or that type of experience. But this boy, Edgar, he responded to her and he, um, he was talking about how he loved shopping too, and in Cuba, and, I, and then he was talking about all these different types of stores he goes to. And Cuba has multiple currencies. So there's like the moneda nacional, which is like the national currency, which is not for foreigners. Then they have a foreign currency, and then they have a black market, and then they have a rationing system. So Edgar was talking about all of these different ways that he gets to go shopping, which you know, which was kind of like a nice surprise. And then he was, he said he felt so sorry um, that that Whitney had to had to know so many people. Died. And I thought that that expression of empathy between two kids who don't know each other was really powerful. Um, this was uh, eventually I had an exhibit in uh, Brooklyn with a, I did partner paintings of the Cuban kids and kind of put them together in kind of like a visual kind of way. Um, so, so there were there were a whole bunch of these. Um, currently, I'm trying to donate them to a hospital in Queens, a children's psychiatric ward. It's taking a but um, they're taking up tons of space in my studio for them <laughs> since 2009, um, 10 years, yeah. So, um, I mean, I mean, one thing that this project was also really good for was just practice, you know, pra practice, technically speaking, you saw what my painting looked, on, looked like early on, and I felt fine about those paintings, and then I also feel fine about these, but it was just good practice to kind of like paint the face in an expressive way, which is something that I'm always really interested in doing. Um, Shortly after that project, I got invited to do a, a residency in Mexico, and um, that was the first time I worked in a prison. And um, this was a women's facility um, in Chiapas, which is the southernmost state um, in Chiapas. And at that prison, 75% of the women who were incarcerated there were incarcerated because they had 
uh, killed their partner in self-defense. So they're victims of domestic violence. And honestly, it's not that different a statistic um, than exists in most parts of the world, including especially the United States. But um, the beauty, the reason that there's a kid here is because um, in prisons in Mexico and other places, children up to four years old, if your mother's incarcerated, the kid goes too. So this was kind of like this yard where they, uh, where they spent the day. And this kind of provided the moms a chance to, to tell their story and talk about their trauma. What was, um, what was kind of brutal about this was that so many of the women didn't even speak Spanish. They spoke indigenous languages. There are 26 languages spoken in Chiapas other than Spanish. And um, so like their access to legal help is basically non-existent. So um, as, as kind of like, well, I remember one mother talking to me about her 11-year-old son who was just, she didn't know where he was anymore because she was incarcerated. And I and that stuck with me in a way that I was thinking like, what happens to the relationship between mothers and children when the mother's taken away? Because the mother, if the father's taken away, the mother's usually the one who's taking them to see the, to the father and to maintain that contact. And um, so I created this project at Rikers Island in New York, uh, working with incarcerated moms at Rikers and their kids in Brooklyn and East Harlem. So um, I went in and worked with the mom. This is, I always start with this postcard because I loved it so much, but this was a mother who um, she had two sons, she has two sons, and she she wanted to, so they were sending art back and forth. So the mom, she traced her hand and she said to her sons, when you feel lonely, please hand here. So I did um, a lot a lot of workshops at Rikers with a group of mothers who um, wanted to kind of like communicate their, their love and their relationship and all different kind of topics that we worked on to their children um, and then Using all of that art, the art both got sent to their children and then it also got incorporated into a big mural design that we worked on collaboratively that the kids then painted in East Harlem. So the moms kind of created a design for the, for the kids um, and then the kids painted it. And then similarly, I worked with the kids um, to kind of send a message to their moms that we um, then painted together in the prison. And I think one thing that I really loved about this project um, more I mean it's kind of, it was kind of an extreme case but in the prisons um, well Rikers is technically a jail where people are waiting sentence but they're often there for up to like three years which is horrifying but um, where the um, the moms were working when the moms were working on the project a lot of the time that this is the one that the kids designed for the moms and it got painted across from the nursery at the women's jail so when the moms were um, working on it, the corrections officers, who they knew quite well, or at least who they they related with often, um, kind of started having conversations on a different level. So all of a sudden, they weren't just inmate. You know, there was kind of like this conversation that like, you oh, you're a, you have a kid, you have two kids, your mom. And I think that like the stigma of being an incarcerated mother is po really powerful because people feel like, how can you get incarcerated when you're a mom and you have kids? You know, and um, it, it's a harsh judgment. So I think that like addressing that stigma and kind of just opening the lines of conversation um, to talk about the relationships that they had with their kids um, was a really powerful thing because just because something horrible happens or you do something horrible or you are accused of something horrible doesn't in any way mean that you're a horrible parent. And then similarly on the outside when we were painting in East Harlem, people would come by and talk to us all the time and then they would say, you know, um, when take my picture, this is where it says when you feel lonely, place hand here take my picture with the mural so you can show it to the moms inside so they know when they come out that we are supporting them. So I think one of the things that the moms talked about a lot is that the harsh judgment that they get in their community when they come back, which all doesn't help in terms of reducing rates of recidivism. The thing that prompted this besides this, the project in Mexico was this reading about a study where um, the best way to lower, or one of the best rates, ways to lower rates of recidivism is to increase the child-parent bond during times of incarceration. If that, and that makes total sense. If the bond is stronger, you're less likely, you're more likely to find ways to stay out of prison the next time. So, so that project um, and other projects and facilities have been really powerful. And then sometimes it's not all, all like prisons with me. I also like to work in, in schools. And uh, this is at a teacher center, working with teachers to kind of articulate the um, the kind of meaning behind their work and what they hope to inspire in their students and at the same school uh, working with students to kind of create a living environment around them about the stuff that they feel is missing from their curriculum. So this is of course with like very um, progressive teachers who are open to exploring the history of the United States beyond the textbook. Um, so this was a really interesting project and just 
what the young people got to explore was really exciting. Um, I've also, I did a project, this was um, a project in Philadelphia, in West Philadelphia, working with incarcerated young men, like uh, 15 to 18 years old. And the first thing I asked them to do was to talk about um, how you see yourself and how other people see you. So they were in detention centers, like in juvenile facilities. And so you can see um, how, how this kid, how he sees himself, good at all sports, DJ, peaceful, kind-hearted, um, knows how to talk to females, responsible, great kisser, humble. <laughs> but you know all of these kind of delightful qualities, and then how he how he feels he's perceived by people in his community or on the street: dumb, black, ugly, not going to be anything crazy, scary, bully, killer, not fun to be around. So kind of devastating um, uh, disparities of perception. So I worked with these young men. Um, on a piece about identity and also exploring racial legacy. This was kind of all after Trayvon Martin. Um, exploring kind of uh, racial, the, his, the legacy of racism in our country. Um, so we, the, this is a different technique. So this is um, something called parachute cloth or polytab. So the, the beauty of this stuff is that you can take it into hospitals, you can take it into prisons, and then it gets adhered to a wall and it, it lasts like a mural. So it's not like a, um, you don't have to you don't have to be in that space to actually have a voice in the community. So it allows people, particularly people who are detained, to have a voice on the outside. So um, then you kind of clean it up. This this is the magic. This the work of this four year old is not necessarily going to be the finished work that appears in your community. It gets cleaned up. Sometimes you'll be painting all day, and then a four year old will come to your project. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So uh, we take it to the studio afterwards and clean it up um, and kind of start to piece it together. And this project was called Heavy Blanket. So the blanket kind of, um, uh, there's symbolism in the blanket that kind of addresses uh, the Trail of Tears, uh, the kind of um, Japanese American internment camps, uh, Emmett Till, uh, in different, different moments. So it's, the, the heavy blanket is kind of what is laying on top of this young man as he's like lays pondering. Um, and then the words that we put into the background were all of the positive words. Um, I am smart, I am a big brother, I'm serious, outspoken. You know, just to kind of have that in the world because there's plenty of other stuff. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit of uh, some technique stuff with you. I know that this, I, I'm supposed to stop at 7.15. Okay. So um, sometimes, oh, only twice, I've done murals where I get to use a projector. It makes everything so much easier. So you can imagine. Usually it's a grid and it is so tedious, but this is a projector. This was a project in Spain. It was for a um, public art festival about um, globalization. So unfortunately, though, that row of windows were bathroom windows. So we found that out like during the projection. <laughs> oh, like this with somebody washing their hair. But I eventually worked out a schedule or kind of like, because I was working on a lift, where where like they would, I would try to avoid and they would avoid and then like, I would try to like bring coffee out the window. But, um, this is like, a lot of people always ask how long do murals take. This mural took about 10 days. Some mural, the one I'm working on right now has taken like almost two years. So every project is different. Um, it helps when you have a projector. This is in uh, Los Angeles at the Japanese American National uh, Museum. And uh, this one, this was a really special project. Uh, it was, you know, there's always, life is always happening in the context of these projects. So like right before this project, I had gotten married and then this, after the second day of priming this wall all by myself, I, um, my husband had a terrible accident and he fell and he like shattered his face and he's fine now, he was just here with our daughter. But um, I had to like leave the whole project for a month and a half with the scaffold, with everything there. So it's it's funny what I see when I look at these murals. Life kind of goes on all around. But this mural I really loved doing because um, it was kind of an opportunity. Usually I'm kind of thinking about my interest in social justice in the past, like with Japanese internment and the way I grew up and the environment I grew up as it relates to other communities, you know, black communities, Puerto Rican communities, uh, Latin American communities, or just communities in detention or whomever. Um, and this was one where I'm a member of the Japanese American community, so they were like, we just want you to kind of express however you want to express, and that was a gift. So I kind of was thinking about the lanterns, these are Noguchi's lanterns, as um, he, he created those. He voluntarily, voluntarily put himself into an internment camp. He didn't need to, but he went there 
which was an interesting move, but he wanted to kind of like go in solidarity. And after he came out, he created these lanterns, which were called Akari uh, lanterns, which is floating light. And the idea being kind of like, what is the essence of anybody when you are completely free from the burdens of your um, like material life? Because Japanese Americans, they had about a week or less to leave all of their material life. You know, they got to carry what they could carry, two bags. And so um, inside of her shirt, there are kind of different symbols uh, painted into the clocks and um, the beautiful poem, from time to time the, cloud gives, the clouds give rest to the movie holders, which is a 17th century uh, haiku from Bacho. But, um, that, yeah, again, they're all really different. This happened shortly after George Zimmerman was acquitted. This was just like a two-day project. Um, sometimes I think that uh, the power of a mural is that it's a really still image. You know, we're so used to flipping through our phones and just kind of like a constant barrage of really fast imagery. And um, when, to me, if something, if something really hits hard and I have the opportunity in a wall and uh, to do something, and I'm going to try to do it. This this was done in 2013, and I was just there a few weeks ago, and it is, and it looks exactly like this now. Like it hasn't been touched in a super graffiti-ridden uh, neighborhood of Detroit. So, I think it's kind of a good. Um, for me, it's a good way to to mark a moment to try to to try to hopefully keep those moments in the public consciousness. Um, sometimes I'll collaborate with graffiti artists. This is a project I did in Argentina, this was also like a two-day project. Um, that's how it got to the number of 80 murals, because <laughs> <laughs> some of them are so fast. Uh, but this was with a friend of mine, um, and this was for a public art event about uh, children at wartime. So in Spanish it says, I dream I can breathe below water, and that is um, just kind of how we often ask the children to do the it's also referencing, I have this recurring dream from my entire life that I can breathe underwater and when I wake up I feel so convinced of it and then I realize it's impossible. So that was kind of like where this idea came from. Um, this is a project I'm working on right now. It's um, the Noble Foundation in Brooklyn. They have new offices and it, the Noble Foundation works primarily uh, to end violence against women, women and girls globally. Um, to support indigenous communities in North America and a few other initiatives um, kind of along those lines. But it's an 8,000 square foot series of walls um, that I've been working on. I, the design and the, um, the design component took about five months because I was working collaboratively with a bunch of their grantees. They have about 600 grantees globally. So I was on a lot of phone calls and having a lot of meetings with their grantees to kind of get at the essence of the work. Um, if you are on social media or uh, you want to look at my website, I've got like videos now that it's much closer to being done. Um, but um, in terms of um, picture books, I'll just go through these quickly. The, the book that I think um, I worked on the most and for the longest was from the internment. It was kind of like from the time I was an undergraduate student graduating in 99, I was like, I have to publish a children's book about the internment because when I was when I was in seventh grade on December 7th, my, um, my teacher said, Katie, today, uh, Katie, you're Japanese, why don't you tell the class what happened today in history? And I was like, it's the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. So I, I told him what happened to my family, and I told him about the internment camps. And when I was finished telling him, he said, that never happened. And I said, yes, it did. And he said, no, it didn't. And I, and I was, you know, 12, but I was like, yeah, yes, it did. And he said, no, no, it didn't. So I, I carried that with me um, because I knew it happened. You know, it had happened to my family. It happened to people that I knew. And I uh, finally uh, made I made it into so many different kinds of books, uh, but I finally made it into a book about these two brothers. This is based off of a story of this of this boy who's my grandfather's cousin. When he got to the internment camps, he stopped eating, and he was just under distress and confused about what was happening. So he um, he stopped eating, and his father snuck my grandfather's uncle. He snuck out of the camps and would go fishing for him at night. So um, I, I reframed that story, fictionalized it, and put it between these two brothers, Carl and Jimmy. Carl was the older brother. So when they got, so the first night of Pearl Harbor, the father gets arrested, which is what happened to my great, great grandfather, because he owned a fruit and vegetable market. So they saw him as a leader of the community, so he was probably a threat. So they arrested him and sent him to a military prison that night. So he told, he tells the oldest son, you're the man of the house now. You have to help your mother and take care of your brother until I return. So. You know, kind of long story short, they they go to the camps, and he what he does is when his brother stops eating, he learns this trick to kind of, um, or he remembers a trick that his father taught him of how to make his fingers be like reeds, and he snuck out of the camp and went fishing for his brother. 
um, that's a very short version of the story, but um, you know, the kind of get to it, I, I did so many drafts, so many versions of this book, worked with my, uh, my, my second cousin's kids, um, they were my eager models, <laughs> and, uh, just to kind of like, you know, fix things like proportion and things like that. And, and I think that um, eventually the set of drawings that I ended up going with, and this is, include, this is kind of part of it, had a more surreal component that related more to my mural work. Um, when I finished art school, I was kind of working a really standard narrative illustration style. And then when I started bringing my mural work and like the multiple narratives that a mural provides into the picture book work, um, they had a lot more more success. So I'm sorry that that book's in here. And actually, I, I meant to bring it too. And I stopped by my studio on my way up here to get the book. And instead, I got two copies of another book, and I forgot it. <laughs> so Fish for Jimmy, it's like a Oh, and the best thing about Fish for Jimmy is that now it's in a textbook. So to my teacher, who told me that it never happened, Raw Hill ended up picking it up and they put it in the textbook. <laughs> so I feel so happy about that. Yeah. But, uh, I um, recently I'm kind of, I did a, came out with a book about my cousins. I have um, 27 first cousins, all different like, racial and ethnic mixes. And but when we got together and everybody, you know, I have cousins who live in Alaska and like Bethel, Alaska, and grow dog sleds, and cousins who were like. Uh, punks in Albuquerque wrote skateboards and graffiti cousins in the Bay Area and you know we were in Michigan and so hippies and so I it was this is a book about um, cousins getting together over the summer and kind of how just through playing together and sharing they learn a lot about kind of who they are and what their um, what their <laughs> culture is like I remember you know my mother is um, white she's French Canadian and Irish my dad is Japanese so like a lot of the stuff that a Japanese mom might teach you, my mom didn't teach us. So I remember when my Chinese American cousins came over and they asked for chopsticks, I was like, we have chopsticks. And my mom was like, here you go. But, um, you know, so it's interesting. And it's interesting to me how my city cousins were afraid of the night, you know, afraid of going outside at night. Um, so um, that book has been has been really nice to work on. And it was, I did this one in collage um, rather than uh, painting, which, which I knew a combination of painting but um, I I have since started drawing a little bit on this iPad but um, everything is kind of done by hand and a lot of back and forth with the with the editors and a lot of hand painted paper and then these are all the things that didn't make it in but I lots of thousands of pillows cut out um, but yeah a couple other books I've done I did this one uh, this was my first book um, I illustrated it the author was Mark Weston it was a biography of um, the founder of the Honda Motor Company which was um, I don't like drawing bikes or cars. And, you know, this book was all bikes and cars, but it was a good, it was a good exercise, and it was an interest. He was an interesting person. And um, the Honda, even though they weren't directly involved in publishing, the motor company brought me to Japan so I could do research, and it was my first time going to Japan. So that was really, really amazing, and to kind of learn about him. This was another book that I did. Uh, it was called Lifelines, a Black Book of Proverbs. So it's a book of African proverbs, and I just illustrated them. Like, um, God's big plan is interesting because I realized like how um, you know how not used to kind of like having the word God in my own day-to-day uh, -day life these days even though I was raised by a Catholic mother and raised in the Catholic Church but this is a retelling of the Tower of Babel story from the book of Genesis so the idea is that in a lot of conservative communities that story has been used to say that diversity was a punishment because Noah's family was building up this big tower where everybody would speak the same language and that God um, didn't want a tower to kind of like threaten his greatness. So God spread everybody around and made everybody not be able to speak the same language and not be able to understand each other kind of as a punishment. But this book kind of says that diversity was always the plan. Also God is, in, what's interesting in this book is God is not he or she, God is just God. So some some things that I found to be interesting about, about working on that project, I'm not the author, they're written by these kind of like uh, Aggressive uh, religious academics, um, and then currently I'm working on two, three books. One is um, this is a study for my new book. Uh, one is called Dad Bakes, and it's about a father. Who, um, I don't know if anybody's heard of this uh, place called Homeboy Industries, but it's a place in Los Angeles, and they have them around the country. But um, but it's a bakery that is also uh, kind of like a program for people who are formerly incarcerated when they get released from prison where they go to get a job or job training or education or therapy. The amount of programming they have for people coming out of prison is amazing. I recently went for research to 
kind of go there and learn about the program that my tour guide, what, it's really like a rehabilitation center for former gang members. And it's amazing. So I, um, the backstory, and this doesn't appear anywhere in the book, but it's about a father and a daughter, and the, da the, the dad is a baker, and he's making this surprise for the daughter. So this is a spoiler, it's a Teddy Bear Brit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's kind of, the, the backdrop is that, because you know, um, millions of children in America are impacted by incarceration, but there's almost nothing for them. So I think that it's one of those things you always hope, and there, there are lots of articles written about this, that books are a mirror or a window or a sliding glass door. And um, even if it's a classroom full of kids who have no experience with incarceration and good for them, you know, better for them, it's good for them to know that other children all over the country are experiencing this as a part of their daily life. Um, so this is a very kind of gentle way to read about it because it's not actually in the, in the story, it's in the back in the back matter. Um, this is the book I'm also working on right now, which is about gentrification. So it's about a girl um, who uh, starts to notice her neighborhood changing, and um, shops are closing, and her neighbors are moving away. Her best friend moves away, so she um, she start her neighbor uh, next door has a, a mechanic shop. And he said, "Oh, where I'm from, when something you love goes away, or someone you love goes away, we paint it on a wall." So she starts to paint the mural on the wall. And um, eventually, her, spoiler, her building also gets knocked down, but she takes a piece of it. So it's kind of about the resiliency of the, the communities that are being relocated or displaced because of gentrification. And it's also about um, just the stories that have always been there before people move. Because I think there's, a, there's sometimes a mentality in, in gentrification that we were the first people there when people have been living there for hundreds of years. You know, so it's telling the stories of the people who are already there. So, um, that just to kind of wrap up, <laughs> this is my first book. And I think that like, what I like about my first book is that um, the element of kind of surprise that um, the mural work has taken on and kind of all of these things, I feel like shows up in my first book. Because when I show this book to kids, they I say, what do you think the next page is? And they all say, butterfly, and it's actually a moth. <laughs> I feel so satisfied by that. <laughs> Anyways, thank you for listening so much. Katie, thank you so yeah, much. Um, Katie has agreed to take some questions. I'm going to ask the first one. Yeah. I've been teaching for many years, uh -huh. and you literally have taken teaching to another level. Um, how do you prepare students to do mural work? Yeah. Well, I think that the most important, well, you kind of do the basics, so um, you, or at least for me, like, do basic painting lessons, yeah. you know, just how to control the brush and things yeah. like that, but then the most important part is that in the design, there are places for every level of painter to work, yeah. and then every level of painter to grow, too, okay. so like, in some of the murals, like the mural with the parachutes, with the, the militarization mural, like, the parachutes are three shades of, like, white, so it's a really easy way to learn shadow, middle tone, highlight, you know, so kind of give everybody a place where they're at and then a place that they can grow into. So it's just like um, when you design the mural, design it for all the different levels. And then I think that the the biggest piece is that people feel like they belong to the team so that they care about it. Because when they care about it, they want to learn about it. You know, these, so if, these students yeah. are doing the whole thing. Right yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and not all of them. Like the one I'm working yeah. on now that's taking me a million years is um, like a uh, just me with I've got seven assistants because it's like a it's like a they're also scaffolding laws have changed like all these things have happened in the yeah. last ten years in New York where you can't have young people on scaffolding yeah, yeah. in New York yeah. any questions yes thanks for the presentation that's great um, there are mural projects that get commissioned mm -hmm. you know and usually there's a committee and they get watered down. Yeah. Like acceptable, and usually yeah. there's no message. Right. But it appears that uh, you don't have that happening to you. Yeah. So I'm curious whether what the process is. You talked about having yeah. conversations with people in the yeah. New community, but it's clear that whatever path you're allowed to go on is right. Well, it matters who the who owns the wall. So if the wall owner is, you know, like the murals that you're describing probably would never hire me, right? So, right, that's right. So, yeah, so, um, but if a wall owner is open to um, exploring different topics that they feel like I'm aligned with, then they might hire me. And then 
Um, but I know what you mean when you have so many cooks in the kitchen, the image can get so diluted. So usually, even even when you have like a, a kind of like-minded thinking group, sometimes they'll start emailing the design out to other people and then all of a sudden you've got so much feedback. So really you kind of, and this might be a little too technical, but you in the contract say the design review committee will consist of this many people, period. You know, and then what you do is you just try to, before it even gets to that phase, you try to do the work in the meetings and in the workshops to really get at the essence of what people want to communicate so that there isn't too much pushback because they feel like, oh, you really heard me the first time. You know, but I, I know what you mean because I do. And sometimes you'll see murals that get designed and they get like approved and then, and then somebody will stop them for some reason and it's so sad. I've seen teams of teenagers like, like have their whole summer work stop because somebody blocks the mural because the teenagers want to communicate something. So it really has to do with who owns the wall. 